Good morning. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning for my last sermon of 2020. I'll be out of town next week. As you know, I always make the pilgrimage to the Holy Land the last week of December, that is to Arkansas, to be with my family and to spend some time of the holidays with them. So Blake and Jake will be taking up the mantle for me and preaching next week. They always do a fantastic job. You'll be sure to tune in for that. And I want to let you know, giving you a preview for January the 3rd, we are going to begin a series starting in January called I Love My Church. And we're going to let that series kind of be the theme for the entire year, although not every sermon will relate to that theme uh, directly, it will indirectly. I love this church. I know you do as well, and I thank you so much for tuning in this morning, and I look forward to 2021. You know, we sing a song entitled Jesus is Coming Soon, and it's, a, it's an upbeat little hymn that goes, Troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear, freedom we all hold dear, now is at stake. Humbling your hearts to God, saves from the chastening rod, seek the way pilgrims trod, Christians awake. And then the chorus, Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon, many will meet their doom, trumpets will sound. All of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Again, it's a catchy, upbeat little hymn. It's also a little awkward to sing. At least it is for me, I don't know about you, but... I find it awkward to sing many will meet their doom with such a catchy little upbeat kind of tone. You know, it's a, it's a haunting type of thought that doesn't seem to coincide with an upbeat cheery tune. Kind of like some of the nursery rhymes we recited as kids. Remember some of those? rock a baby in the treetops, when the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall and down will come baby, cradle and all. Wait a minute, What? I'm supposed to go to sleep now when all I can think about is a baby falling to its demise? Or what about this one? Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater, had a wife and couldn't keep her. He put her in a pumpkin shell, and there he kept her very well. What an odd message to send to kids. What an odd message to send to adults, right? And there's plenty of others, Humpty Dumpty, Jack and Jill, Little Miss Muffet, and the list goes on. Many of us remember these nursery rhymes or these lullabies with fondness, but when you dissect the words a little bit, they can be a little unsettling, right? Same is true with that hymn, Jesus is Coming Soon. But here's one thing that is certain. He is. He is coming back. And because he is coming back, our readiness is paramount. Robert Winsett wrote the hymn, Jesus is Coming Soon, in 1942. America was coming out of the Great Depression, heading into World War II, so it's no wonder that he penned the words, troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. He also points to the Christian's hope with the words, troubles will soon be o'er, happy forevermore when we meet on that shore, free from all care. We are experiencing troublesome times, no doubt, whether it be COVID, racial unrest, a political divide, whatever the tribulation, troublesome times are here. But let's not act like this is something new. There has been a phrase that has been used over and over again this year. It's the phrase, these are uncertain times. And certainly that is true, but they're not unprecedented times. We have been living in uncertain times since the fall of man. I've heard somebody say recently, it's never been worse than it is right now. Have you read Genesis chapter 6? That's not to diminish anything anyone is dealing with or going through at the time. But these times, while they're uncertain, they've always been uncertain. Ever since Adam and Eve chose to eat from the wrong menu, we have been experiencing troublesome times. But here's what is certain. Jesus is coming back. There's no doubt about that. You can take that to the bank. What is his ETA? Well, we don't know, right? Our Lord has not given us a due date. And those of you who have had children know about due dates. And what you know about them is that they're fluid, that you can't necessarily take them to the bank. Your doctor tells you this is the day that we think your baby will come, and it could be weeks earlier, weeks later. It's fluid. So what do you do in the meantime? Well, you prepare. 
If you were like my wife and I, we had a go bag, a hospital bag prepared, and we sat it by the door, and in that bag were diapers, you know, the, the, the outfits you're going to bring your baby home in. We sat it by the door so that when that time came and we had to go to the hospital, we could just pick it up on our way out, and we were ready to roll. You know, we need to have a spiritual bag packed and ready. We all need a spiritual go bag so that we are prepared when the Lord returns. You know, one of the major themes related to Christ's return is that of readiness and preparation. No due date means that we have to be ready at all times. But that's difficult, isn't it? Because it, the longer it takes for something to happen, the more we begin to distrust that it's ever going to happen. Eventually, waiting for not yet leads us to thinking not ever. I don't know about you, but waiting is not one of my favorite things to do. I'm not a good waiter, which is unfortunate because if you think about it, most of life is waiting, right? Waiting in the doctor's office, waiting in line at the DMV, waiting for, you know, the, that loan to come through at the bank, waiting for you to get your first job, waiting, waiting for God to answer your prayer, waiting for your child to come back to the Lord, perhaps. For every green light, there are five yellow ones and a dozen red ones. Most of us would rather do anything but wait. And some would rather do the wrong thing than wait. But over and over again in Scripture, God tells His people to wait. God keeps His people waiting. Remember the promise made to Abraham that he was going to be the father of a great nation, just not anytime soon? Here's a trivia question for you. How long was it before the promise came true? It was 25 years. If you guessed that, pat yourself on the back, give yourself a gold star. Imagine being 75 and instead of heading to a retirement home, you're headed to the maternity ward. Imagine being told at 75 years that you're going to be a dad. That's crazy enough. Now imagine that you actually become a dad at 100. God led Israel out of slavery and toward the promised land, but it would be 40 years before they were allowed to enter. The prophet Jeremiah told those in captivity that there was a glorious future on the horizon. Well, not for all of them. For some, because it would be 70 years before the promise would come to fruition. God promised the Messiah, the Redeemer, would come and God's people waited. Isaiah spoke about the coming Emmanuel some 700 years before it actually happened. Christ arrives on the scene. A small ragtag group of disciples follow him, follow his teachings. They follow in his footsteps. They wait for him to become the expected deliverer. But instead... He was crucified, and they waited three days. He rose from the dead. Things were looking up, but just a few weeks later, he leaves them again. And just before he ascends, the disciples ask him, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? Or in other words, is the wait over? Jesus tells them to wait in the upper room for the Holy Spirit. And we're still playing the waiting game. Romans 8, 23, Paul writes, And not only this, but we also ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. And we wait, and we wait. Over 40 times in the Old Testament, God commands the people to wait on the Lord. And this theme and this thread runs throughout Scripture from the first words to the last words of the Bible, verse 12 of Revelation 22 reads, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Now, it may not seem like it's quickly or soon, but in light of eternity it is. And in verse 20 of Revelation 22, John writes, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. It's as if John is saying, Yes, Lord Jesus, come. We'll wait. We'll be here when you get here. And here we are, still waiting. And some of us are okay with that. We're not necessarily in a hurry for Jesus to come back because we don't want to leave this wonderful life that we have built here on earth. Or maybe you're not ready. Maybe you still have some packing to do. And if so, let me ask you this question. What are you waiting for? And I don't mean to ask that in a judgmental or condescending tone. I mean, why do you think God keeps us waiting? I don't think any of us can answer that definitively. But I do think that God is up to something. What God is doing in us while we wait is every bit as important as 
what's going to happen when he returns. A great example of this can be found in the experience of the people of Israel as they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years before entering the promised land. Why did God make them wait? Well, notice verses 2 through 4 of Deuteronomy chapter 8. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. So during the desert decades, God helped the Israelites grow up. He removed pride and he proved that he was their provider. Did God want to keep them out of the promised land? No, of course not. He wanted them to enter, but he wanted them to be prepared to enter. The pain of waiting through the seemingly unending delay served to teach the Israelites some vital lessons. Sort of like the two music professors who were listening to a beautiful, pure, young soprano. And one of the music professors said, her voice has such a purity to it, such an innocence. And one of the other professors said, yes, and it will be even better when her heart has been broken. The point is that certain passions can only be learned through pain through experiencing pain. There are times when God allows us to endure the pain of waiting for the sake of the song. Another great example is found in in John chapter 11. Remember when Jesus delayed in going to Lazarus' bedside, and, and while waiting for the miracle worker to come onto the scene, Mary and Martha watched their brother die, and only after he was dead in the grave for four days did Jesus finally arrive. And when he gets to Bethany, Martha says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. In other words, Lord, if you hadn't waited, my brother would still be alive to this day. Jesus then raises Lazarus back to life, and as a result, these ladies learn an amazing truth about Jesus. If Jesus had come when they asked him to, if he had come when Lazarus was simply sick and healed him, which Mary and Martha certainly would have liked, they would not have seen, they would have not experienced the resurrection and the life in such an up-close and personal way. Waiting was an opportunity for Jesus to disclose more than they had ever known or thought about when it came to the Messiah. You know, much of the New Testament writings are dedicated to instructing God's people on what to do while they wait. We see Jesus and Paul and Peter and John talk about how we need to be good waiters. And the exhortation is always the same. Being a good waiter is about being ready, and being ready is about becoming more like Jesus. Waiting isn't always enjoyable or easy, and it was never intended to be, at least not in a spiritual sense. God works Through our waiting. Our waiting is an opportunity for all of us to prepare. So, what this means is the way we wait makes all the difference. Look with me at Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 35. It says, Be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast, so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. Whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had not had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too, be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming and begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave 
who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. There's a lot to dissect in that passage, but I think one of the major themes, one of the primary principles we can take away is that we need to be good waiters. And how do you be a good waiter? Well, it tells us preparation, be dressed in readiness, maintenance, keep your lamps lit, and then expectation, wait for the master. Before we go any further, I think it's important to note the, that Jesus is presenting two different images here. The first one is a servant master motif, and this image was intended to encourage the waiters. Then Jesus moves to the owner thief imagery where our Lord is viewed as an unwanted, unauthorized taker. So what you see is in that first image, the master owns the house. In the second image, the man owns the house. In the first image, the master is welcomed. In the second image, the thief is barred from entering, and so he digs a hole uh, through the wall. And so what makes the difference here, what determines whether Jesus is a welcomed master or a dreaded thief, is spelled out in verses 35 through 37. Be dressed in readiness. And keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast, so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. So ready, prepared, and hopeful. The expectant one is the blessed one. The one who anticipates the master's return is the one who will be blessed when the master comes back. You know, when I was a kid, my dad had several jobs. He worked as a, as a supervisor at Emerson Electric in Paragould, Arkansas. He was also a rice farmer, a crop duster. And on those rare occasions when he had some time off, I would dress in my baseball gear. I was a catcher, and I'd put on all my catching gear, and I'd get my glove and a ball, and I would wait at the window to watch for my dad to come home. And when he drove up into the driveway, I ran outside and I said let's play dad and though he was tired and probably that was the last thing he wanted to do he would spend time playing ball with me that's the picture I see here that the expectant one is is standing at the window watching and waiting for for Jesus to come it shouldn't surprise us here the relational aspect as well there is a bond between the servants and the master obviously the homeowner didn't know the thief The servants can't wait for the master to come. They're so so excited. They're not fearful. They love the master. But on the other hand, you have the owner of the house who hopes the Lord never comes because that represents loss for him. The servants were waiting for the blessing that came with the master's return. And the homeowner would rather live life on his own terms than rather be bothered by an unwelcomed guest. Based on what we've been talking about this entire year, can you read between the lines? Can Can you dig beneath the surface a little bit? You know, this, all, this whole year we've been talking about, you know, making the connection from the old to the new, connecting Israel to, to Jesus and to us. And when you look at the underlying message here, you see the connection, don't you? Who are the ones who anticipated the master's return? Well, they were the disciples, the faithful, the ones who followed Jesus, the ones who accepted Jesus as the anointed one. And who does the owner represent, the homeowner He represents the Jews, the scribes, the Pharisees, the ones who rejected the Messiah, the ones who refused to acknowledge the Master. But there is one similarity between the groups. The fact that neither the servants nor the owner of the home knew when Jesus would come back. That's the similarity that we see between the two groups. Driving home the point that the way we wait means everything. It makes all the difference. The message to the nation of Israel is a message that, that is every bit as relevant to us. That one's attitude toward the Lord's second coming is directly connected to one's response to his first coming. So if you accepted his first coming, then you're going to eagerly await for him to come back however those who refused his first coming they're not going to have that expectation they're not going to anticipate and they're not going to care when Jesus returns it's not going to be a welcomed event the way you treat his first coming makes all the difference in the way you treat his second coming you ever heard of Wernuven Wernuven maybe is how you pronounce it somebody who knows don't call me out on that because I'm doing my best Wernerfs or Wernerven 
These are the civil engineers' answer to calming traffic. And it all started in a city uh, in, in Delft is the name of the city, a Dutch city. And residents there were angry about the high rate of speed that uh, motorists were traveling through their neighborhoods, through their streets. And like every el everywhere else in the world, certain measures were put in place to kind of calm the traffic. Uh, there were, you know, speed limit signs, those, those uh, digital signs that tell you how fast you're going and start blinking when you're going too fast. There were speed traps and speed bumps that were implemented, but none of it seemed to work. And so they decided to come up with a radical concept in the city of Delft. They turned their city streets into living yards called Wernuven. Streets became shared areas. What was once reserved exclusively for cars became outfitted with tables and benches and sandboxes and parking bays jutting out into the street. These Wernuven essentially turned the road into an obstacle course for the motor vehicles. The twists and turns, the brick pavement, the periodic raised areas brought motorists down to a slow crawl. Because I don't care how big a hurry you're in, no one wants to run over somebody. Well, almost no one, right? Can you imagine the reaction of Americans if they were be flying down the highway and all of a sudden they come across a sandbox jutting out into the road or a strategically placed roadblock? Here's a better question. Ever feel like God's trying to slow you down? You're zooming through life, trying to make it to your desired destination, and God is using the obstacles in your way to slow you down, whether it be illness, a financial crisis, a broken relationship, or a pandemic. Perhaps God didn't cause it, but maybe He's using it to help you to grow. And to get your attention, because most of us race through life at warp speed, and unless something slows us down, we're never going to take our foot off the gas. And in all our busyness and hurriedness, it's easy to forget that we are waiters. That the most important thing in life is not how much we can accomplish. The most important thing is how we wait, because we are waiters, whether we like it or not. And what do we do while we wait? The waiting makes all the difference. We don't like to wait. It's not in our DNA. Tom Petty had it right. The waiting is the hardest part. What do we do while we wait? <laughs> That's such an American question, isn't it? What do we do while we wait? What am I supposed to be doing? Our waiting should be about preparing. Every day is an opportunity to pack your spiritual go bag. And what do you put in your spiritual go bag? You put readiness and faithfulness. Let me ask you this morning, are you a child of God? And if not, may I ask, what are you waiting for? If we learn nothing else from the passage in Luke that we read this morning, we learn that being ready is key. We also learn that God is waiting as well. He's giving us time to pack. So let's start packing.